Hello and welcome to episode 63 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is my gardening podcast. I am broadcasting to you from early July, a hot, sticky, green-walled study in early July. It is later in the day than I anticipated. The light is fading outside. I need to get out there and water my potted figs. I couldn't record earlier because down the road on Goose Green, the the local primary school is having its summer fair, and they have been singing medleys of Bugsy Malone and playing reggae all afternoon, which has been quite fun, but but isn't necessarily the, the backdrop for the the garden log. Anyway, we are here, we are recording, and this week I am talking about a horrible catastrophe, a terrible mistake I made in the garden this week. I'm talking about a trip to Hampton Court, I'm talking about Acanthus spinosa and the Clematis rebecca, I'm talking about Achillea, I'm talking about Cornus cusa, I'm talking about arborescence hydrangeas. It is a a heated plant-filled extravaganza, And unless we get on and start talking about it, there will be no time left. So come on, let's hear the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. I started to prepare for this week on the Saturday preceding it. And of course, by prepare, I mean worry about it. I was worrying because it was one of those scorching hot Saturdays for which we English have neither the infrastructure nor the temperament. I was off for a picnic in Battersea Park which is quite a lucky place, by by the cycle ride there. It's quite a lucky place because it was laid out by those shade-loving Victorians, by men in waistcoats and suit jackets and thick silk hats who were designing with the the help of their womenfolk, their womenfolk in those tightly buttoned dresses with the ruffs at the sleeves and at the collar, with them in mind. So trees, trees everywhere, wonderfully shady canopies of, of overarching exotic shrubs. That was some small blessing. But even walking through there, even the shrubs in the shade were suffering, particularly the, those arborescence type, type hydrangeas, the ones like Annabelle that you see planted. And as soon as the temperature gets above about 26 degrees, they all limply hang their leaves as if they were made of wet, green tissue paper and look pathetic, almost like some particularly manipulative cat looking up at you with with vast watery eyes saying, I'm so hungry, as it licks the crumbs from its recent meal. They are needy little plants, but they got me concerned and on edge about the things in the garden because we have done quite a lot of planting recently. So I sat there having my picnic and drinking a cold beer and wondering, oh dear, well, what are happening to my plants? In the end, I managed to pull off a little mental trick and convince myself that gardening is a is a career of of mental well-being. And if I'd wanted to worry about work on the weekend, I could have gone into criminal justice or finance or, or something. So I managed to put it out of my mind. Or maybe it, was, maybe it was the beer. Anyway, I focused solely on the picnic and resolved to see how things were on the Monday morning. And they were fine. Of course they were fine. Plants aren't as delicate as we convince ourselves they are when we are far from them. It's always when you're a flight or a bus ride or a long train journey away from your precious specimens that you worry most about their susceptibility to cold or to frost or to rampaging plant thieves. And they're always fine when you get back. The arborescent hydrangeas were doing the same trick as the ones in Battersea Park had been doing, of course. That is their want. Slightly more concerning was the newly planted Cornus cusa misatomi which had all of its leaf tips pointing down at the mulch. And I know that is a habit of this plant, but I was trying to remember if it was quite that extreme when I had left it on Friday, 
or if something was was seriously amiss with the, the little miss. It's also a worrying plant because it has that habit, have you ever looked at it? It has the habit of sloughing bark from around the, the stem like a plane tree does, but it does it in more of a dramatic and slightly more diseased looking fashion. So you're always worried, oh, is, this, is this a stem rod? Is this plant on its way out? Should it really have, have got rid of all of its outer layers like that? Ours has a, has a particularly concerning ring just around the, the soil line that looks exactly like it would were the plant planted too deep and suffering from a stem rod. But I believe it's not the case. I believe it is just a, a particularly annoyingly placed bit of bark slough. I think the plant's fine. I gave it a lot of water and it hasn't really made much difference, but there's no, there's no, there's no slide into, into decay or noticeable perking up. So I think the plant probably just looks like this and I've forgotten the normal look under a green sky. Anyway, Monday was hot as well. The other plants that, that, that were suffering were, were some candelabra primulas in the tropical area, but that's really not surprising in any way at all. I think candelabra primulas would would protest about drought conditions if they were planted at the very bottom of a pond. They are really water-loving things. And the old leaves at the bottom tend to dry out and go a, a crinkly, floppy sort of white colour. You've just got to give up on them. They're far too demanding to concern yourself with every leaf on them. Give them, give them a couple of bucketfuls and let them get on with it. And we finally had the heat that I had been praying for last week that got everything into that whoosh of growth. The dahlias are advancing happily upwards. I really must stop complaining about the dahlias. They've been in flower for about four or five weeks now. And if I was growing dahlias from cuttings, I would only just expect them to be forming buds around now. So, so really they are doing very well for themselves. The poor little things, I'm maligning them far too much. The red hot pokers are doing amazingly well, sending up all sorts of orange thrusts, and the Crocosmia lucifer has burst into flower in front of the brick wall, which gives this whole garden a sort of burning up, middle of an inferno look, something really suited to, to high summer. Unsurprisingly, I spent most of the day watering and watering with sprinklers rather than standing with a hose pipe but because there are various sprinklers in various places you spend most of the time walking between various points picking up a sprinkler and moving it it's a versailles style water engineering version of spinning plates and so i kept the plates spinning for the whole of monday and then went home with the, the garden looking perky and me feeling contented reassured that everything had got through the weekend. On Tuesday, it was even hotter. So I dressed up in a skimpy outfit and covered myself in a very sticky sun cream and went to do some above the head hedge trimming, which has the effect of giving you a sort of botanical tar and feathering. You end up with all sorts of hedge debris, bits of twig, and old spider web and earwigs clinging to you in a, in a fine sheet. I was using a very long pole hedge trimmer and I was having to wave it very, very high above my head and still cut a straight edge. These weren't, these weren't sort of remedial hedge trimmings. These weren't cutting back or taking out any particular old wood. It was just trimming off new growth. But boy, had that new growth come on when you are reaching up as high as you can above you and cutting through blackthorn and holly and bramble, it all does come raining down quite quite hard and terrifyingly. Occasionally I would have to, to turn my shoulder and, and knock a lump off into the hedge. It looks good. Hedge trimming is something I didn't used to be very confident in. And I thought there must be some sort of trick. There must be some way that these people who've been doing it for years have of, of getting things straight. But I've realised that it's just time with a hedge trim in your hands and a bit of confidence. And eventually you, you just feel for it. It's like cutting a loaf of bread. I don't know if you remember childhood experiments with sandwich slicing. I certainly do. And that bread knife would go in all sorts of directions. I'd make the most extravagant wedges of bread, 
So whoever came to make a sandwich next would see this, this almost rhomboid loaf lying around on the table. And then, as the years rolled on, I didn't even think about it. Now, if I need to get a, a millimetre perfect centimetre, centimetre and a half slice to fit within the confines of my toaster, I didn't even think about it. I didn't go on a training course or, or buy a, a bread cutting guide. It was just time with a bread knife in hand. And I think the same thing has happened with my hedge trimming. On the U hedges, the ornamental ones, I'm cutting a very steep batter. So they slope diagonally back away from their away from their base as long scaling triangles, which I think is a very nice effect and keeps the hedge dense at the bottom. And I'm trying to do something similar with these tall mixed hedges, but it's harder when you are working at height. I don't particularly want to, to hire a scaffolding thing. We're getting up to that sort of height. So so I was I was waving things around and cutting a pretty straight hedge on those. My best tip with hedge cutting is to always stop an hour before you think you need to, because clean up is something that you massively underestimate every time. Once you've gone through with a rake and a blower and a barrow and taken it off to where it's going to be chipped or composted, you realise that, gosh, I should have been in bed 45 minutes ago. So always stop early, allow plenty of time for a clean up, a cup of tea, drink lots of water, and of course make sure that there are no nesting birds that you are going to disturb. On Wednesday, I realised that it was quite a long time since I'd given the hardcore decomposition fans an update on the compost heap. Well, you will be pleased to hear that this is an update. It is very claggy, it is wet and horrid, still hot, still decomposing, still cooking away, but far too grass dominant at the moment. We've used all of those leaves collected over the autumn, those leaves that looked like they would last forever, that looked like enough leaves to bury the garden 15 times over, have gone in and been sucked away by all the bacteria and little microorganisms, and now we are just putting grass after grass after grass with the occasional wood chip into the heap. So now when I scoop it out with the bucket of the digger, and then upend the digger's bucket, it plops out in the perfect form of that metal bucket. If I didn't wiggle them around and smash them up a bit, the whole heap would be formed into these things. If I put them in the oven, they would probably bake into the rudimentary materials to make a mud hut. But with a little bit of effort and stirring, they smash up. And as I said, the heat remains hot and it's not stinking. So I'm not particularly concerned yet. If, if it starts to, to get wet enough to put itself out, as it were, then we will need to take serious compost in action. I added some things that weren't grass to it, mainly a lot of Verbena bonariensis. And this is self-seeded Verbena bonariensis. It's one of these plants that really is true, that old cliche that if it likes your garden, it likes your garden. Some people say, oh gosh, don't plant Verbena, it self-seeds everywhere. And others say, don't plant Verbena, it's just a finickety thing. It never grows properly. Well, we are in a self-seeding Verbena garden and it has taken off to a great degree last year. I think the baking heat through the midsummer really cooked that seed nicely. It gave it that, that Argentinian heat that it needs. And so we have seedlings everywhere and we don't need that much of it. It needs to stand behind things, flashing that electric purple flower head. At the front, you realize that it is not a dainty plant. It is not this thin, athlete little thing. It's actually very rugged and rigid of stem. It's quite fat and thick and thuggish, that stem. It's ribbed and very dark green. It's almost a light sucking type of green because it's it's so textured. It's like ancient gnarled crocodile skin. It doesn't glimmer and shine and give an impression of freshness. So I don't like to see much of the clumps of the front stem. So I pulled all of that out and just left the stuff that grows up behind the dahlias and the, and the red hot pokers and the clematis and the canna in those hot borders. And there it looks perfect. There it is the plant for the place. It's not as trendy as it once was. When I first came into gardening, it was the cliche plant. Oh, you're going to Chelsea to look at the verbena. But you don't really see it anymore because I suppose it's been done too much. Now, I suppose it's like centre partings on teenage boys. It will come back eventually. 
On Thursday the week continued its slide towards the unbearably hot, and I went off to Hampton Court to see the, the flower show, or as it is now, the, the gardens festival. I cycled there very stupidly, and it's about 18 miles each way from where I live in south-east London. So the morning ride was beautiful. I set off early and I sort of flirted with the river all through Chelsea and down to, to Putney and went off on the dirt paths under the ancient trees and in Putney and Wimbledon Common and then out to Bushy Park. And it was a delight. It took me hours because I was, I was completely meandering, but it was, it was very pleasant. And then I spent a whole day wandering around the flower show buying things and weighing myself down and then got back on my bike and decided I'd go straight home which was a long straight inhalation a proper infusion of builders exhaust fumes as I went through Morden and Merton and all the various types of tooting they have down there it was hellish absolutely hellish the show was good though the show was was nice. I haven't been for a decade, so it was good to see. The setting is beautiful. The plant stalls were, were lovely. The gardens nicely planted. I bought lots of little Achillea, some lovely, lovely pale Achillea. Achillea Hella Glasshoff, which is short and rigid and self-supporting. It isn't going to fall over with that great umbilifer on the top and nothing on the, on the ferny leafed stem. I can't help but feel a little sorry for, for the poor old garden at Hampton Court. That magnificence of it, of the long water. And then the indignity of all of these Panama-hatted garden tourists stomping all over it. I feel also sorry for those poor unaware visitors who come on a pilgrimage to Hampton Court. Die-hard Henry VIII fans probably travelled from, from Texas and Missouri and end up just staring at a load of red-faced gardeners dragging around their, their Achillea. But uh, there we go. We've all got to live in this world together, I suppose. On Friday, I went back to work, and I did one of those fundamental gardening screw-ups. The thing that you should really stop doing after the first summer in the business, and never do again. Yet I managed to do with unerring regularity. Every year I make a mistake that I really would not expect an apprentice to make. And this time I cut the grass too low. And I knew I was cutting it too low as I was doing it. I was thinking, oh, this is chancy. It had gone a little bit too long. And I could hear the mower blade slightly struggling as it went through very, very thick grass too low on the stem but it sort of looked okay and I carried on going for a bit and then took a load of grass off to the compost heap and by the time I came back the sun had beat down on the, the grass I'd cut and it had silvered in the heat you know when you get a frayed end because your mower blade hasn't cut cleanly you've done a, you've done a bad job on it it's silvering turning white which means it will then turn brown and i could see almost swirls in the grass little 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 hemicircles where where the blade had gone in deep which will go brown and yellow it's not doesn't look pleasant it's very unsatisfying to do a job where you where you end up leaving something in a worse condition than than when you encountered it and um it weighed very heavy on me for the rest of the day because, of course, most people would look beyond it. It wasn't the whole lawn. It was a little bit of lawn, but it was a quite an important part in front of a terrace. And to me, I couldn't see the garden beyond anymore, just see that little, those stripes of lawn that were wrong. But, of course, I suppose most people's eye would be carried beyond them and you wouldn't really notice. But uh, I found it I found it very, very galling, and I still do. I'm hoping that, as I sit here recording, that, that there is water gently suffusing that ground and that fresh new green grass is, is growing through. I don't really want to have to go back on Monday and be reminded of the idiocy that I should have long outgrown but there we go, it's, it's a lesson you live and learn, and I think it probably has got me out of lawn cutting for a significant amount of time. There are other people who can do lawn better. I can wander around and, and think about plants. I think that um, that I did that in the afternoon. I instead went and dug out a load of Acanthus spinosa. 
And this Acanthus spinosa has been in the garden far longer than I have, but I've never known it look good. It has always come up completely mildewed and hung around as a big mildewed mass and then and then died a death. Acanthus is that amazing plant you see on the on the, the Roman columns at the top. It is it is a spiky leaf thing and particularly Acanthus mollis, which is my favourite, can look fantastic. It can be a great big leaf thing with this alien spire in purple and white that looks like something that would have been dreamed up by a, a B movie illustrator. And it has these huge, huge leaves and it's called Bear's Britches for some reason. But but here in this garden it doesn't work. This this mildew, you normally you associate mildew with a problem of maybe the plant being too dry. This can't be the case because Acanthus is famous. It's the plant that, that grew over the ruined blocks of, of ancient Rome when all of those British watercolorists were going out there and, and painting the ruins of the Colosseum. It was the Acanthus that was the lurking, ruderal presence there on the blocks. So I think it must be the airflow. I think it, it lies in a little valley between two flower beds where narrier breeze touches and there I think it just gets itself infected with its own fungal spores every single year. So I dug it out. The roots are very, very thick, and I doubt I got all of them, so I'm sure we'll get little acanthus lutes. The, the, the roots, they, they almost look like they should be edible. On the one day I have spent working in a professional nursery, I did it as almost a taster course when I was at the garden museum, we spent the day potting up root cuttings, of acanthus, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And I decided that I didn't want to work in a nursery because it did seem a little bit like factory work, but with soil instead of nuts and bolts. But I'm sure that's not, that's not what it's like for most of the time. But anyway, I digress. The, the acanthus is now gone. In the place, I put in a couple of my very favourite red clematis, clematis rebecca. That's a very clear red, uh, a pillar box red. It's very well known. You probably have seen it. And now I think about it, actually, clematis are quite prone to mildew as well. Hopefully they get a different strain and that here the air is, is slightly better. I put those in with a, with, a, with a quite nice wrought iron support and I'll grow them up to about five foot, hope they didn't let them cascade as a mass of, of green and red. The leaves are good on those as well. They're nice and green and fresh and, and healthy. So that, that, that was a pleasant way to spend the rest of the day. That's something to take my, my mind off the, the abject failure of the morning, to go away with, with some pleasing, promising plants that hopefully will deliver for, for years to come. When the, the lawn botch up is forgotten by me in a week's time and by everyone else in, in four days, these plants will still be providing delight. That's the way I'm choosing to deal with it. And like I said, I'm very good at this, this self-care business. And talking of self-care, that took me to the end of the working week. We had Friday beer o'clock. That's when we drink a beer all the various contractors who happen to be knocking around and talk about what we happen to have done that week. No one really listens to each other. We just we just spend a bit of time in each other's company and then go off. So that's what I did. And now I will go off and see if we have any recommendations this week. My first recommendation this week is from Australia. I think this might be my first Australian recommendation. It is a gardening television program called Dream Gardens. And it's worth watching if you enjoy the Australian accent, as I do. But also for the presenter, who is a landscape architect and gardener called Michael McCoy. And he is very good. He's very knowledgeable. He understands a garden. I thought I'd come across his name before. And um, then I looked him up and it said that he'd worked at Great Dixter. And so I got out my, my various Dixter books. 
and I found him in Dear Friend and Gardener, that collection of letters between Christopher Lloyd and Beth Chatto. And he is in the opening pages because he, he offends the great Helen Dillon, the doyen of Irish gardening, who goes to, to Australia and gives her normal spiel about how Ireland's soft and wet climate needs dusky mellow tones. Here under the harsh Antipodean sun you can plant bright and bold and clear. And Michael McCoy says, well surely that's nonsense, surely it should be the other way round. Surely you need bright in the murky old world which I suppose is showing his his heart of great dixtiness. And apparently she didn't take this well, and she refused her coffee if she had to have it in the presence of this Michael fellow, which, was quite, which is quite a nice anecdote. Anyway, he's very good on the programme. He says lots of sensible things to the clients. What I most liked about the programme is it's a grand design style format, but they don't shy away from telling you how hard gardens are. These gardens take six months to build. They're not two guys and a girl with wheelbarrows and a sledgehammer who get it done in two afternoons while, while the owner's off in Coventry visiting her sister. These are teams of people with expensive machinery and budgets that, that overrun and they buy mature trees that cost $3,000. And this, this guy, Michael, he's very good at pointing things out, pointing out where, where clients don't quite understand. They say that they've bought a view that's $150,000 worth of view. You've blocked it off by putting a tree there. That's You cost me $15,000 worth of view with that tree. And they don't understand that, that a view needs breaking up. It needs something foregrounding in it. And that the human mind needs sheltering. We need savannah trees to feel safe. We need at least the impression of a canopy. Even if we don't actually have a canopy shading us. We need something that gives the form. Something that is higher than a person. And spreads out somewhat. To make us feel that there is shelter somewhere. Whereas lots of clients just want, want their seafront view. And nothing blocking it. So that's worth, that's worth watching. Dream Gardens. Search for Australian channel Dream Gardens on YouTube and you can find a couple of episodes of that. And then obviously because I had the book out, I couldn't help but going back and rereading some of the letters between, between Lloyd and, and Chateau. And I was just struck by how generous they are towards the young and how enthused they are by young people how they both seem to draw energy from young people i mean christopher lloyd's famous for for the fact that he who wanted young people to come and stay with him at great dixter he liked their energy around him but beth chateau too she was all about her students the students who came from germany and japan to work with her and she'd go to restaurants and say, gosh, it was mainly full of old people, but it was it was nice to see there were some long legs and mini skirts in there livening the place up. They both wanted to be a brown, bright, lively young people. And it's such a contrast. I've also been rereading this week some of those horribly cantankerous racist letters of of Philip Larkin. Early on, He's writing to Amos. He's writing to, to Kingsley Amos when he's still at Oxford University. So he must be, what, 21, 22 at most. And he's already fantasising about the two of them being cantankerous old men slapping each other on the back and complaining about their ailments and, and hating the world. And it's, it's no small wonder that he turned out to be a very different sort of, of old man to, to Christopher Lloyd or old person to, to Beth Chatto. So that was nice to, to go back and familiarise myself with. I have to say, even even they, master writers though they are, cannot turn an insult quite like Larkin. Though I suppose they knew they were writing for publication. Maybe they would have been slightly more salacious in their gossip, were it not a contrived project. That's well worth going back and reading though. Uh, Dear Friend and Gardener, the letters of Christopher Lloyd and Beth Chatto. No other recommendations this week. I might read you another one of my plant essays next week, but uh, I'll save it for then. Thank you very much for those of you who got in touch to, to say how you enjoyed that reading or, or anything you've heard recently. If you'd like to to stroke my ego as well, you can find me on Instagram where I am ben underscore dark underscore or on Twitter at Ben's Garden or you can email me at the Garden Log Podcast. And finally, there is a Facebook group 
It is called the Garden Log Podcast. There's two Facebook groups. Join both of them. One of them's a, a like a page or something. One of them's a forum where you can ask me a question or two, and I will happily answer them. I, I quite enjoy answering those questions for people. So unless you are planning to get in touch electronically, or you are one of those people who I see in my day-to-day -day life, then I will bid you goodbye until the same time next week. Mm -hmm.